so our title today um, is The Art of Explaining Science to Non-Scientists. And, um, you know, it's meant to be a compelling uh, title to sort of like pull people in. Um, I'll just mention that um, my area uh, of research and study has been more around communication studies. Um, so I did a, a first degree in, our, in uh, English literature and then communication studies and more recently information studies. I completed a PhD at the University of Toronto. And uh, I've been teaching kind of this topic, like mostly around science communication for about the last five years and doing a bit of research in the area as well. Um, so my angle into having you think about how we share um, scientific information or specialized information of any sort, you know, all of us have, you know, what some people might consider jargon, we have sort of specialized terms that we know. Um, and so for all of us to sort of think about how we share information. So I'm hoping that these will feel like kind of useful strategies that you can employ um, as you as you explain things to other people, as you share your specialized knowledge. Um, so yes, uh, I was already introduced, but my name is Diane DeChef, and I'm currently, I moved from the Writing Center just this summer, this past summer, I moved to um, the Office of Science Education, which is in uh, the Faculty of Science at McGill. So it's giving me a chance to be a bit more integrated with the, the scientists, a bit more, um, you know, part of the, the people that and I'm thinking about how they communicate. So that's been really great. And I'm really, yeah, thrilled to be here as part of part of your workshop series. Okay, so I'll move along a little bit. Um, I'll share a copy of these slides. At the end of the lecture, I have a PDF and my email is there. So if anyone wants to follow up or be in touch, feel free to do that. So it's just dianedechef at mcgill.ca, but you'll get a copy of the slides. So you'll be able to see that link there. Um, and I think the introductions that I made here are things I already said, so I'll just move to the next one. So here's an overview of what we'll cover in the next hour. Um, so there's kind of three key parts. One is us thinking about what a general audience needs. So I mentioned that we all have kinds of specialized knowledge that we hold. And when we share it out, we need to think about the people that we're communicating with. And obviously, we need to tailor this a bit depending on who we're talking with and we all have experiences with this but I'll just point you to a couple of studies that have been done recently that speak specifically to the needs of a, a non-specialist or sort of non-scientist um, type of audience and the second way is thinking a bit more about being really clear and compelling with what we're sharing with the kinds of information we're trying to get across and then the last couple of slides are about where to do this. So if you're interested in being more involved in sharing your knowledge, this just gives you some sort of like jumping off points. So if you want to get more involved in different areas, there's some suggested sites and then some resources for you. Okay, so we're going to roll into, this is where we'll start um, just with learning a little bit more about you. So, um, a big part of thinking about science communication or communicating with non-specialists is really knowing who is the audience. So who are we trying to, you know, get our ideas across to? And and with these questions, I have three questions in total, but with these questions, I'm, I'm trying to learn about you. So I'm kind of modeling learning about my audience, but it also helps me in terms of, you know, fine tuning my presentation today. So if you could, you don't, you don't absolutely have to, but if you're feeling up to typing into the chat, um, maybe let me know about where you learn about science from outside of your field. So I know some of you do have science backgrounds. So, you know, it's like the stuff that you, you know, haven't studied for years. Um, and for those of you who don't consider yourselves to be scientists, where is it that you learn about science? And, you know, it might be from this, this series or from other, um, some other MCLL courses that you take, but more broadly too. Somebody mentioned the New Yorker, You're like feel free to add that in. So just take a minute and put in the chat. Yeah, where you, where you learn about the kind of science that you're reading more for enjoyment or for practical information, not because it's your area of specialization. So I'll look for some of these to roll in. So I see oh, astronomy magazines, awesome. Okay, Sandra, that's great. Thank you. If there's any specific sort of like general audience um, things that you pay attention to, it'd be great to hear about them too. 
Yeah, Psychology Today. I think Psychology Today does a wonderful job of distilling things into really useful ideas. So that's great to hear. Newsletters. Absolutely. That's a great one to point to. And thanks for naming a few. Actually, I haven't been reading uh, the Carbon Brief or Climate Tracker, so that's really great. Madeline, this is really, yeah, so Mediasaur, great. Oh, yeah, Nature Magazine, absolutely, really great. And nature is interesting, too, because it's like it does have some specialized information, but it's like meant for such a broad readership that it's so a great one to, to look into. Science Today. Awesome. Thank you. OK. Oh, great, Senator. Good to see. I have a few examples that are from a writer for The Atlantic, so you might recognize some of those, too, if you've seen them already. The Lancet, Good Nature. Great. Awesome. This is really great. Uh, I ask this question for every group that I talk to, and it's really interesting. The grad students almost put in almost everything from YouTube. So it's, it's interesting to sort of like see the differences in sort of what people are paying attention to. Okay, thank you for those. If anyone else wants to add more, feel free. And I'm just going to ask you a second question now. Oh, second and third popped up there. So second is, um, what do you like most about these things that you're reading? So in the, it looks to me like most of you are reading too, not just watching YouTube videos, but what is it that kind of catches you or compels you? What do you like about, about checking on these? Oh, Paul, I'm also on Twitter and it's a fascinating place for science too. Um, so yeah, you know, one or two things that really kind of capture your attention or things you enjoy as you're as you're reading these these or yeah reading tweets I guess too okay so yeah the headlines are important you like it to be concise so these are often shorter versions absolutely kind of a focus on recent developments expanding knowledge Yeah, okay, this is great. Um, Ed and Naveen, when you talk about the, the story, like that there's a story, there's a scientist, there's some narrative. So these are some of the things I'm going to talk more about. So hopefully others will enjoy those things too. Yeah, figuring out the human more. And often in science writing, we don't see a lot of the people who did the stuff, right? So it's, you know, in the like a research article, it's more just like, here's the findings in great detail, which is wonderful. And we can do, you know, reproducible work from them. But we often don't really think about the people behind did and sort of like all the human things they've been through to get to get these findings for us okay wonderful okay awesome yeah and being informed about new things absolutely okay great thank you for these and then i'll just add a third question so again feel free to keep typing into the chat if you haven't finished either question one or question two and i'll just post my third question so if you were going to put into action some of the things that I'm sharing today, who would you want to talk to about these things? So who are you thinking about as sort of your audience? Who would you like to sort of gear things toward? Okay, great. So I'm seeing some peers and friends, family, friends. Absolutely. Okay, and yeah, Gordon, I'm seeing about the New York Times in New York or National Geographic all do such a fantastic job. Yeah, neighbors, acquaintances. Yeah, especially people who might be reluctant. This is like a really great audience to think about too. Yeah, particular, particularly climate. Yeah, uh, Policymakers, absolutely. They're, they're kind of a specialized audience, but there's some really good materials for thinking about communicating with policymakers too. Okay, yeah, and sometimes like patients too. Okay, great. This really helps. And I would just say just a quick note um, about 
thinking about communicating with people close to us, they are actually the people that we are most, you know, um, best prepared to communicate with because we know them best. We know them as an audience. We kind of know what they like, how they think, what their values are. So it's easier to sort of connect to them and to think about the ways that we can, you know, say things that will be impactful or sort of frame things in ways that they can sort of pick up and make sense of. So um, often it's really important to be sort of like, a, you know, maybe we can imagine we're almost like sort of like nerds in our network or, you know, like we're sort of able to sort of share things and influence the people around us because of our specialized knowledge and we're able to share it out. So it's really great that people are already thinking about like people that I know and are close to me as some of the main audience. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for this. And yeah, mentioning David Suzuki too, who's, you know, really being a, a pioneer in, in this area in Canada for so long. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. And what I'm going to do here is have you work with the chat one more time, um, at least one more time. And so I'm going to put up a piece of text and you don't have to read the whole thing, but what I'd like you to do is to just start to read through it. And as soon as you get kind of like a feeling about it, if you're sort of like, oh, this is how I feel or, oh, this is how I feel, um, just type a word to describe that feeling into the chat. So I'll open it up now. I'm just looking for how you feel as you read this. All right. Thank you for people who are starting to type in. So, <laughs> so yeah, just your first feeling is great. All right. We've got a pretty strong first feeling of being confused. <laughs> sort of like, what is this about? Um, Sandra, it sounds like maybe you follow cricket, so you're <laughs> familiar with it. Um, so I've just shared with you something that even if you were following following modern day cricket, there might be some challenges to understanding this because this is the description of a cricket match in 1896. And I've given it to you without much context. Um, and the reason that I've shared it with you is because this is how people often feel when they're presented with scientific information um, without much context, uh, with very little thought to the kind of specialized vocabulary vocabulary that exists. And this is the feeling that you might have had as you read it that we want to avoid whoever we're communicating with having. So we want them to be able to sort of like, you know, pick things up as we put them down. We don't want them to be like, what are you talking about? Because often people will choose not to continue to listen or to read if that's the feeling that they get right off the top. Um, and actually, a lot of sports writing is kind of like this cricket match, but probably we only read sports writing that's about a sport we already know or we like. But if it, to an outsider who doesn't know that sport, it's like a really sort of insular style of communication. Okay, so thanks for letting yourself feel confused there with that example. And we'll just talk for a minute about uh, the kinds of needs that vary between, um, you know, people working within their fields, so scientists and researchers, as some of you are, and then um, what, what we need when we're not in that mode, when we're interested in a topic from outside of our field. So usually scientists and researchers communicate in really specific vocabulary, and it's a kind of shorthand, right? You're able to be very clear about what you mean and what you're talking about in a very quick way when you share that same lexicon, that same vocabulary. Um, people also look for quick access to key information. So a lot of the sort of specialist articles, like research articles, are written in a way that has a very specific order. So there's a very kind of uh, agreed upon standard. So you can just kind of quickly move to the section that you want and make sense of it. Um, scientists or specialists also rely a lot on figure. So we're always, um, you know, if we try to want to make quick sense of a research article, we would go straight to where, you know, things are displayed for us visually. Um, and as mentioned, we have this sort of anticipated structure. So we know that uh, if we want to understand, you know, the methodology, we can head straight to that section. 
In contrast, non-specialists or non-scientists have different kinds of needs when we go through it. This should be something that we are, you know, engaging with for enjoyment. So, one of our main feelings is that we want to feel like this is for us. We want to feel like included as the story unfolds. Uh, we don't want to work too hard. We don't want to keep flipping back to be like, what, what was that that they described this as? Let me get that definition again or that um, abbreviation or acronym. What did that stand for again? We don't want to see that kind of thing. And we also want to enjoy the experience. And so for, you know, for all of us, stories are something that we've been taking in throughout our lives. And so we often relate more to story structure. So especially to stories that are told, um, you know, based on time, sort of like past, present, future storylines. Um, and that there, are, you know, there are characters that we have a sense of like sort of the human and sensory experiences of, of what's happening in this explanation so that we are, you know, we can picture things. We have an idea of how things may be, um, smelled or felt or looked so we can sort of put ourselves into that understanding we can understand from from a full body kind of perspective I'm going to talk to you about a couple of studies, or actually it's two papers written from the same study that looked at the effects of jargon or using specialized language when explaining science. Um, and these were done by having people read short segments of scientific explanations on, online and then report back how they felt or sort of what, what that um, information meant to them. So this first study found that if if accommodating language was used, then people were on board. They were like nodding. They were continuing reading. Um, so it was important to communicate to non-specialist audiences with more accommodating language. And in a minute, I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. They also found, though, that defining terms. So if there was a piece of vocabulary that it was like, people won't know this term, so I'll just teach them the definition before I carry on. People didn't like to see these definitions. So I think it probably reminded people too much of text books and they were like, I'm not here to take a course. I just want to read this article. So defining didn't help. Um, it was important to use language that was like easily processed by people. And to me, this part that I have in bold at the bottom is the key thing, but the use of like difficult specialized words are a signal to people that they don't belong. So if people are running into a lot of specialized terms, they're just likely to be like, this isn't for me and kind of like moving out of that. So not bothering to follow along. And here I've given two examples. So these are, this is text that was used in the study. So I'd like you to read through both one and two. And then in the chat, just type in the number of the one that you preferred to read. So the one that you like made sense of and was preferable to read. Okay, so we have mostly twos. There's one at the top. All right. So in terms of the study, the second one is the one that was made um, more accommodating or to have the jargon reduced. So in the first one, we have these two bold terms. So we have motion scaling and tremor reduction. Now, um, so these are these these phrases have like these two words put together and we understand each of the words, but when they get put together, it's like, what does that mean exactly? Um, whereas in the second example, it's more of a description of what we can see. It's something that is like, oh, this is what it looks like. And this is something that's much easier for us to understand. Like we could, you know, if we were sitting together and seeing this, these are the kinds of words we might be using to describe it. So it's much more accommodating. It's easier to take in. And I think I have, um, yeah, a lot of specialized terms are like two words or, or more put together in sort of a specialized meaning or a specialized use. Um, and so it's better to instead, and these are kind of often nouns, like 
uh, compound nouns. And it's better instead to use verbs to sort of describe what we're seeing. So, you know, we all understand, we get what programming is. And so it's like programming to have this effect. And we didn't need to know the specialized terms that they were using in the study. That doesn't benefit us at all. It's more just we want to know the outcome. We want to know what happened there. So the point to be had there is when we're thinking about, you know, explaining things to people, and if it's in writing, we sort of have more time to think it through. But I know I have a I have a child who's six years old, and I'm often doing that kind of translation for them, right? To be like, what what words do they know? And those of us who move between different languages, we do this all the time. It's like, what's the, you know, what's the language I should be reaching for now and using? Um, so it's important to be kind of drawing on those things, really thinking about who our audience is and what will make them, you know, what are words they definitely know and use and can, can visualize. And I think it's important, um, just before we move into the second uh, paper, it's important too to think like this isn't dumbing it down. It's more like connecting with your audience. It's more thinking about like what's going to make sense to these folks and then really following through with the, the words that are going to, you know, keep people coming with you instead of being like, I'm out. This is getting too confusing. This is too hard. So the next uh, outcomes from the same study it relied on the same data set, um, and this one I find a you know a, a bigger a bigger point that they're making, and that they found that if it was harder to process or harder to make sense of information that was presented, there was less buy-in. So people were less likely to believe what was being presented if it had more specialized information. So I think this is like one to really take to heart to really think about. Um, is that, you know, in some cases we might be writing to people, you know, asking for funding or it was suggested like writing to policymakers and we can never persuade people if we're not using their language, right? We want to use the terms that they're going to use. And I think it's really good, you know, if you're thinking about talking with somebody about a topic that's maybe you're a bit like, oh, it's kind of a big deal to have this conversation. It's really important to think, how do they talk about it? So what words are there or what terms are they already using to make sense of this and to use their their words to kind of use their terms because we can see you know there are several examples right now that are about very important things that we can see people aren't buying in people aren't believing things and to some degree it might be that things have been presented in like you know too much specific language this kind of you know jargons come their way and it's sort of like turned them off it's made them not want to continue learning about it not entirely that but that can be part of it for sure and just a quick mention that abbreviations or like acronyms, um, these are also a kind of jargon. And we probably all had this moment where, you know, we're in a workplace or we're having conversations and people are just throwing around letters that have a lot of meaning for them. And we're like, what is that even about? Um, and that, you know, abbreviations are a big part of academic writing because it's, again, that kind of shorthand, like you've defined a term once on page one and then you're using it throughout the paper. But if you go away from that paper and come back to it, often you're like, what was this again? And you have to flip back. And we never want the people that we're communicating with to have to go backward. We always want, you know, in English, we were reading from left to right and we always want them to continue going right. You know, we always want them to keep moving forward. So anytime we ask people to go backward, we have a, a, a there's a risk of them sort of jumping out, them not continuing to listen to us. So it's really important to just replace those acronyms with words that, you know, mean the same thing. It doesn't mean you have to write out the full thing, but you could substitute part of it in. And um, I have a link here from, uh, there's this organization that I think is really great. They're called Massive Science, and they do a lot of science communication training. But their audience is a little more specialized than sort of a general audience. They expect these to be scientists. And I was recently reading an article that uses this abbreviation, BMI, and they used it in a different way. So what do most of you think BMI stands for? If you had to had to say it, you can unmute or you can put it in the chat. What does BMI mean to you? Body mass index. Thank you. Yeah, that was my, you know, that's what I always think of it. But in this one, they used this abbreviation repeatedly, and it stood for brain machine interface. And I kept being confused. I was like, what are they even writing about? So because it was a familiar abbreviation with a different meaning, I had to keep going. Um, you know, I had to keep being like, what is this again? And so in this case, instead of saying BMI, which has a different meaning to so many people, they could have just said, 
said, you know, like these interfaces or these brain machine interfaces, you know, they could have just said that and it would have taken maybe a few more, you know, a little more space in the article, but it would have been so much more clear to, to me, at least, who had, you know, this different um, understanding of that same abbreviation. So I think the, you know, the Unless you're absolutely sure in your audience that everyone knows a certain abbreviation, like maybe you probably all know MCLL, you know, that one's okay. But it's super important to think like, oh, I'd better make this more clear. I'd better really spell it out to people. Because even if there's somebody, you know, in a, you know, in a volunteer space, in an organization, there might be somebody who's newer to it that just doesn't use that same acronym. And so it, it leaves them out, makes them feel like an outsider, and they might not be as, you know, engaged or as interested in moving forward. Okay, yeah, military is very acronym centric. And I, you know, I see too, like a lot of organizations, you know, people want to learn the acronyms to fit in, but it's not, it's not a great goal in general for us to have so many acronyms, although it is, you know, it's a specialized place, the military, so it makes sense. It's like for ease of communication. Okay, so jargon, abbreviations, these are things that um, a general audience does better without as much as possible. And this is something to, we mentioned as in terms of like non-specialists like, you know, it should be enjoyable. So I'm just going to have you read through this piece of text. And after you've read through it, just tell me anything that sort of stood out to you or anything that sort of was an interesting phrase or something memorable from it. And you can just type a word or two into the chat. So read and then what's memorable can go into the chat. Okay, so thanks for your comments in the chat. This is great. Um, so I gave you this without much context again, and I didn't mean to be so confusing this time. So this is a, a quote or kind of like a the first paragraph, the opening or the lead, the sort of hook from a piece of writing um, by Ed Young. And I can see a couple of people are fans, as am I. Um, so Ed Young writes a lot of papers. Uh, I guess he's mostly at The Atlantic now, and he's written one book, and there's a new one coming out, I think, this month or next month. Um, and so he is a really, um, I guess, a strong science journalist. And so he really humanizes science in his writing. And um, I just wanted to point here to some of the, the sort of elements that make this more of a story, I guess. So he's writing about a biologist named Bob Payne. Um, and Bob Payne is uh, responsible for this phrase that's used a lot in biology about a keystone species, so sort of like important species within different ecosystems. And what Ed Young has done in the rest of this article is sort of like tracked the uh, lineage of people who studied with Bob Payne and then who their students were and sort of shows like the significance of a science network. And I find the way that he's written about it to be quite profound. So before before we go through and do a full discussion, Jean, did you want to? Yeah, well, talk? I want to add that the article is very clear and answers the usually the five questions you have to ask yourself when you write an article, who, what, where, when, and how. And he's answering all of those in sequence. So it makes it makes the subject very clear and what is happening. 
and who's doing it, to what, to whom is he doing it, and so on. So, so he's asking yeah. you who, what, where, when, and how. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. You know, and he is, you know, he is a journalist. Ed Young is like a, a science journalist. And so I'm sure he's learned, you know, he's like had that drilled in and this is the way to go. Um, what I find really interesting about this piece is the way that, um, you know, if we read a scientific article by Bob Payne, um, we would never see like this, we would never picture him, you know, we would never have a sense of what he looks like. And it looks like the the sea star that's described as sort of like maybe a keystone species in his studies. And so he, um, you know, he is throwing them, there's kind of like this tension between Bob Payne and the, uh, and the sea stars and also kind of a comparison of how they look. Um, something else that's interesting is at the end, he has, there's a quote from him, you know, and even though a, a research article is always, you know, it's written by the researchers themselves, we never really hear from them in their own words. And so I think a big part of, you know, sharing specialized knowledge out is that we actually get a sense of like the people doing the doing the work, like what it what it was like, what it smelled like, what it felt like, um, you know, and here, you know, there's quite a lot of description. And I agree that there's not much um, there's not much context here. So this there's just a question about so this particular piece. Actually, I'm not sure I have the link here for the. Uh, the article, it's called Dynasty, but I, I can't remember if it was published in the Atlantic or not. Oh, it's a question from Paula. Sorry, I didn't, everyone didn't get to see that one. But um, but yes, I am referring to the Atlantic magazine when I talk about Ed Young as working at the Atlantic. Um, so I think uh, it's really, people mentioned in the chat that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of action and there's a lot of images. And I think in ways like these are things to consider drawing on. I know maybe this, this one piece felt a bit like confusing or sort of like, where are we with this as we read it? Um, but I'll just point to some of the, on the next slide, I've highlighted a few words. And I just kind of wanted to point to, to some of these ways that I think there's a few phrases that are really, that really kind of go a long way in terms of us, um, you know, being able to picture or visualize what's going on. Um, one of those is like this description of where he is. So we have the, the, you know, he's on the Pacific coast and it's like kind of this rocky coastline. And then a lot of the description is very kind of power, like strength it's focused on. Like he talks about brute strength and he, you know, he hurled them. There's a mention of a crowbar, powerful grip, you know, and even this verb, like the to prize, like we don't often see that verb, um, but it's, it's a verb that does a lot. You know, it sort of has me picturing something quite visual. So I think it's a, you know, it's a neat, these are neat things to think about. And I think it's important, um, I'll probably say this a bit more detailed in a couple of further slides, but it's important for us to sort of, you know, when we explain things, we don't have to turn it into a full story. We don't have to become, you know, magnificent storytellers, but to borrow a bit on the, the tools of storytelling or sort of like what we enjoy in terms of like more literary works and to sort of like pepper some, some of those in. I think that can be quite powerful in terms of people have a, you know, having a feeling for what we're talking about and like picturing themselves doing this. All right. So kind of to summarize that, um, it's really great to be able to hear scientists speak conversationally about the kind of work that they do. So for those of you who have, you know, scientific backgrounds, this might be something within your networks that people are quite curious about. Like, what do you do at that bench? Or, you know, what is it that you're doing in terms of, um, you know, what does your analysis actually look like? So I think that, you know, people often want to know, or like, what was surprising to you? Like, what kind of challenges did you face? I think those are things that people really love to hear about science. And there's also something that's that's quite amazing to think about. And it's this idea of, of narratives like stories and how they work with our brains. So because we've been hearing information in story forms our whole lives from, you know, the earliest childhood stories and beyond, 
um, thing, information told to us in more of a story has more of a privileged place within our cognition, within our, our brains and how we understand things. So it's much easier to remember and sort of tell again um, and to just to understand when we can hear things in a more of a story format or more of these story details. And there's also my middle bullet. It, I ha I'm introducing this term called narrative transportation. And this is the one you've all experienced this, I'm sure, but this is where you're listening to somebody else tell a story or you're reading a book and you feel carried away. You feel like you've been transported elsewhere by the story. And that is, you know, this is because when we read or hear about people doing things, we can picture ourselves doing these. And there have been studies that have looked at, at our brains when we're listening to stories or reading stories, and the same regions in our brains light up as if we were doing the things that are that we're reading about, that we're taking in. So, you know, when we read about Bob Payne throwing a sea star, we might be sort of like experiencing that somewhat in our own brains as it's happening. So, it's a pretty, you know, we want to be able to transport the people that we're talking with so that they too can sort of understand and be, you know, be interested in and engaged in the, the activities that, that we're telling them about. All right. So this is, you know, this is kind of the introduction of the needs of a general audience. So if people have questions here, I'd love to pause before I get into a few more elements. I'm going to talk a bit more about structure and style in the next section. So anyone want to like raise any questions or sort of, uh, you know, extend anything that I'm saying now? Feel free to put up your electronic hand or I can carry on too. Yeah, Sandra, go ahead. I have a, a question when you're doing um, explaining science to non-scientists. I know in medical research ethics, we tell physicians to write the consent documents in a grade seven level language. Would it be the same for general public for science communications? Yeah. I mean, it, the more you know about the people you're writing to or communicating with, the more you can kind of gear things toward them. And that can be, you know, if you're making references to like pop culture or to something people read, like it's nice to know what they've engaged with. But in terms of like reading ability or the kind of vocabulary that you're using, I think that's a good, safe place to be. And it's really great to hear that, you know, grade seven is the the level, because even if people are better educated than that, they might be, you know, working in a second language. I know my friend is probably not, you know, it's not at the university level of French. So, you know, I think that's really great to, to know that that's the case. Laura, did you want to go next? Uh, yes. Um, I'm intrigued by your statement that when we're transported by a story, and I mean, I love reading and uh, I am often transported, but I, I, what I did not realize is that the same areas of our brain are activated as would be if we were actually doing the action. I find that really interesting. Are they activated to the same degree or is it less? I doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> there's quite a okay. few papers on it. So um, yeah, I, when, I, when I share the PDF I can, of the slides, I can include, there's another link that has a few different um, articles on narrative transportation that I can share with you too. But yeah, even if you look up narrative transportation, there's quite a few studies that involve sort of studying the neural networks. Um, and it's, yeah, it's fascinating stuff that I've just, I've just gotten interested in like in the last year and a half or so, but I find that I don't know all the details, but I do find it really interesting too. Yeah, well, I find that very interesting because there are many times that I would rather read about something <laughs> and actually experience it. I find it like a, a richer experience. So now I know why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Paula, did you want to go next? Uh, well, I just wanted to say that um, I have given a few scientific lectures uh, that are complicated, not to, not to me because it's now well known, but to the audience. Um, and so I try to use as many uh, pictures as I possibly can. Mm. It's, it's the best way for them to see what it's all about. Um, pictures in different stages. This is in the beginning, then after that you have another picture and then it goes to this and to that and so on. At times it's very hard because the terms don't allow for pictures. <laughs> so uh, that's where the narration comes in. But still, it, yeah. it, 
it's hard. I know that, uh, you know, a couple of times people would ask me, how, how much longer do we have to be here? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like students of all sorts but um yeah but i do i think visuals are very important in science and you know often um yeah the complexity of them like it's definitely important to think just like we're talking about like the language um not you know not being too specific i also find like often my students will be like oh i'll just show this picture and it's like there's so much going on in this figure and so it's also like it needs to be simplified sometimes too and probably you're doing that and even the what you're talking about with the order like it sounds like you're building a narrative almost visually you know and i think that's really powerful too so it's great mm -hmm. Shasan, did you want to go next well yeah it's just that uh that's why i'm taking this uh, lecture we we would like to be good storytellers. By being good storytellers, we can explain things. I'm thinking of TED Talks and so on. And by the way, this would apply perfectly for TED Talks. But it's not given to everyone to be a good storyteller in writing or orally. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, we can learn things, but we're not going to acquire this by li listening only to one lecture. It has to be practiced. Yes, yeah, it's a great point. And there are, you know, even, yeah, in Montreal, there's even some, like, uh, some workshops, like, you can take part in to practice and, like, t practice telling each other stories. But I agree, it's something that, you know, and I'm just start like, I'm just kind of beginning taking to heart what I'm teaching and starting some of my lectures with a little story or, you know, just kind of modeling those things. And it's hard for me. I'm, like, not used to doing it in that way. But I think it's worth it. Like, I think it's worth it for us to you know, sort of spread our wings and like try to take on some of these different ways of sharing information and especially, you know, for me to model it to students for them to think about it also. Paul, did you want to go next? Sure. Just a quick uh, question, but I think you're sort of answering it as we go along. I'm interested if the rules that you're putting forward or the guidelines or suggestions apply equally to oral explanations as well as written explanations. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there are slightly different things. Like I know um, when I'm teaching, you know, if I'm some, I've taught like podcasting versus, you know, a written explainer, that sort of thing. And, you know, there are some different guidelines, like when people are just listening, you need to do a bit more kind of um, signposting, letting people know where they're at. So I would say there's a few intricacies that differ, but I think the things that I'm talking about so far are um, generalizable to both, to both modes that we can be thinking about. And, you know, probably even more, more simple when it's story storytelling to think about it in that way when it's written there's a bit more you know people can make sense of the full the full set of information is all in front of them whereas when there's storytelling it's a bit more like you need to make sure they're really with you so simplifying a bit more in that mode all right so thanks for those questions and comments i appreciate them and it's nice to hear that everyone's like on track with me so far so i'll move into this next section um with thinking about science in ways that are clear and compelling and here um, I'm looking at both thinking about the structure of what you're sharing, as well as some kind of stylistic decisions, some of the sort of like word choice and things like that that go along with it. So I've thrown in here a little bit of a fuzzy version of narrative structure. This is probably a diagram people recognize from, I don't know, school, high school and beyond. But, um, you know, there's this sort of Hollywood structure of storytelling where it's sort of like there's an opening, there's a conflict, you know, there's some kind of climax and then, a, you know, a denouement or a resolution at the end. And um, this is a, an important you know, this is important to think about what kind of structure your audience is used to. So what kind of things are they used to taking in? Um, you know, what kind of moves them? And that we're, we're not necessarily telling a full story from beginning to end, but that we can borrow some things from sort of storytelling or some of these narrative elements. And as an example, like kind of an exposition or a setting or providing context and sort of describing a scene can be really important as we begin sort of 
like what's you know what's the situation that we're we're talking about you know if there's a little tension that can really help so like when we're talking about research you know sometimes it's like the challenges that the researcher faced some you know what was difficult um you know was this something that was kind of like brand new nobody nobody knew was important yet or you know what were some of the roadblocks along the way um you know sometimes it'll, it's interesting to hear like you know where were you when this finding came through like what was your reaction how did you feel you know some of these sort of human components and then in terms of resolution it's often when we're talking about research or science it's often like what does this mean for the future or like where will this go next what are the kind of questions that fall so we can kind of think about this sort of structure and you know we don't need to follow it to a t but we can think about borrowing from it that some of these things will make what we're sharing more interesting and so it's good to think like the, the audience will have certain kind of structures in mind already, certain things that are familiar and that we can use those to be similar or we can sort of play with those. We can sort of put things in slightly different order. And sometimes if you're like, what, you know, what would they expect or what would they like to see? We can think about what our own expectations are when we're the non-specialists, right? When we're the non-experts, like I asked you sort of like where you get your science from when it's not in your area of expertise. So when you're the kind of reading for fun, where do those things come from. Jean, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I just want to add analogy is pretty important. And I'll mm. give you an example. There's an article in the Gazette this morning was about uh, <clears throat> the gene therapy for a possible uh, cure for Alzheimer's using CRISPR. Well, CRISPR is, is an an, the analogy for CRISPR is scissors. Scissors to cut the DNA uh, molecule. So, uh, that kind of analogy sometimes helps to understand, although it's still very vague in my own mind, how <laughs> anything could be, scissors could actually cut a DNA strand. Yes. But, but anyway, yeah. it's, it's no, I agree. Explain. I agree. Yeah. I know, and CRISPR is one of those words too, right? Where it's an acronym. So we're being sort of like asked to understand it when we're just seeing like the abbreviation, just the words related to it. But I know, um, yeah, I've had lots of students write about CRISPR and the scissors often comes up and it's still like, you know, it's on such a different level than we use scissors, but it is really helpful. It's definitely one of these stylistic tools. Um, so in terms of structure, we often want to open with something that's broad enough or will catch people's attention. So we can, and, you know, sometimes that, that context can help, but sometimes we're, we're just sort of like kind of looping things in. We don't want to be too specific off the top. Um, definitely this sort of chronological order, the past, present, and future works very well for explaining research, especially to be like, this is where it used to be. This is what this does. And like, here's how it can, can go forward. Forward. Yeah, Sandra, have you ever is really great too. It definitely um, continue, works in that direction. And, you know, a lot of my students have, you know, were recently in high school and they've learned to write essays with themes, like sort of like, here are my three points. And those do not go well in terms of storytelling because it's like, why those three? In what order? So that's where something that's more chronological makes a lot more sense to people who are listening. And then I mentioned signposting about, about um, especially if you're speaking with people as opposed to writing, because it does help tell people sort of where you're at. Like if you have, you know, that sort of like past, current, um, and future, it's helpful to say those words even, you know, to kind of let people know where you're at along the, you know, chronology. So that was thinking about structure. And here I'll just mention a few things related to sort of stylistic components. Um, so we talked a little bit about word choice in terms of jargon. And I did mention off the top that it's really helpful to think, like especially if you know you're going to be talking with somebody about something to sort of hear how they, you know, do or don't talk about it already. What are words that are closest to the topic and sort of be able to pick up from those. Um, and then what are some key images that you can create for your audience with your words? So uh, it's great if you have an opportunity, like Paula mentioned, to actually use visuals. That can be really compelling. But if not, like, what is it that you might want to describe to people? So if you're a researcher, or if you have some specialist knowledge, like, is there an event or a scene that you think could be really powerful if you put it across in words? So to think about what words would do that would be great. 
And then this gets back very much to Jean's example with um, the analogy of CRISPR to scissor. So is there a metaphor that would be effective? And I know this helps a lot like with, with kids like my daughter's age to be like, what do they already know? What can I kind of build on? So using an example of something they're already familiar with, and then how can I add to that? So they definitely know scissors, you know, so you can kind of move, move up from there. Um, so there's a couple more things to think about that are a bit more specific. Yeah, Jean, did you want to mention something yeah, else? Just uh, tongue in cheek, somebody answered, uh, explained what a uh, uh, CRISPR was, was an enzyme. Now my question is, what's an enzyme? Yeah, same. I know. And well, a lot of people... It's still not clear in my mind what we're dealing with. Yes, exactly. I know we have a we have a science book at home for my daughter that has a lot of visuals and it's really helping me. <laughs> Where I'm like, I haven't studied this for a long time. So it's really beneficial too. Um, so a couple more notes about things that can be really useful. So one is like when you're explaining is to ask questions, like, do you know what an enzyme is? And, you know, before you're like building on information about enzymes that you assume people already know. Um, another one is to, to use good verbs. So I mentioned already that a lot of jargon is nouns or like compound nouns or phrases. Um, if we can use verbs with people, these are like the action words that sort of move, move things along. They are much stronger and more illustrative. So it can be really great to be like, how can I describe this with actions as opposed to just like noun things that just sort of sit there. And uh, when, you get, when you receive these, there's this link here to something called zombie nouns that talks about, especially in academic writing, we've moved to this place where we, we use a lot of nouns instead of verbs. And they're, they're kind of, um, they, they clog up writing, they make the stories less vivid. And here's just some examples of when, when things are made into nouns, they're called nominalizations. And so this is where, you know, we gave a report, made a decision, but why not just use these verbs? Why not say reported or decided? And there's things like, you know, I can say, you know, like we use to do, to make, to be, to have a lot. These are verbs that come up over and over again, but let's use our imagination to use ones that, just, that sort of create, you know, visuals. So as an example, I can say, oh, I'll go make the coffee. Um, but I could also say, I'm going to brew the coffee. And that has me doing something that's a bit more exciting. Or I can say the coffee is percolating, you know, and we can picture like it's bubbling, things are happening. So we have a lot of choice in the words we use. In English, we have tons of different different verbs that, you know, could be used. So it's often like, what's a vivid one? What's one that creates something in our minds as it's said? Okay, so that's just a little table with a lot of different, you know, versions. Oops. All right, so this is just kind of a summary. So it's looking again at some of the stylistic choices we have and then ways of thinking about structure when we're making these explanations. And then I just wanted to move to thinking about the opportunity for creativity, or as the title of this talk was about art, for us to think about how to use this when we're talking about science. So um, I think science is really, you know, often we, we think about it or learn about it in ways that are kind of dry, like there's a lot of memorization and things. But when we share it with people, there's a lot of opportunity to make it richer and to, you know, to share it in interesting ways. So I'm just going to point again to this um, fellow Ed Young and something that he did when he was writing like a science explainer. And he was describing the first time that a, a cardiogram was attached to this large whale in the wild. And the way that he wrote about it is that um, it was interesting. So I could see the whole page when I was reading this and every paragraph is the same length. And you can see here in the highlighting at the bottom, I'll just let you read that for a second. So he has written each paragraph to give us the feeling of just how slow a blue whale's heart beats um, when it's conserving oxygen. So kind of contrasting it to how we know our own hearts beat and instead sort of giving us a sense of like, whoa, that is really slow that I can read this whole thing. And that's one heartbeat of a whale. So to me, this is kind of a beautiful kind of creativity in terms of structure that he could play with that and make that happen. And I think it's really important for us to think about 
about ways to be creative when we share science. And, you know, sometimes it'll be with the visuals, but sometimes it's like the verbs we choose. Um, I had a student one day talk to us to a class about peat bugs, and she was talking about peat bugs as like the lungs of the earth. And a couple of times she like touched her own lungs and somehow it just made the whole thing come through in such a, you know, profound way. We could all kind of connect our own breathing and lungs to that of the earth and that the peat bugs were, you know, doing that kind of job for the planet. So I thought that was really powerful and so simple, you know, something that just kind of moved us all. So in my last couple of moments, I just want to point to a few resources for people who are interested in doing more of this kind of work. Um, so uh, there was a mention of Twitter when somebody was was just saying where they get science from. So there is this hashtag SciComm that has a lot of different sort of science communication um, kinds of details that people might want to draw on in terms of seeing what kind of science communication is out there. Um, you know, often if people want to do things like be on a podcast, if you, you know, especially for like smaller, more local ones, I'm not talking about Joe Rogan, but, you know, some people will be happy to have guests on, on podcasts. So there's certainly opportunities there. If you just like let them know you like their podcast and that you have a certain expertise, you might find yourself on it. Um, many of you might already be f familiar with the conversation, but this is where a lot of academics um, write for broad audiences about their topics and they have editors at the conversation that help academics create more like more of what we're talking about so more sort of for lay audiences for broad audiences they can write articles that are sometimes there's a bit of an opinion but there's also quite a bit of analysis that's included so that's a great place to check out if you want something that's more persuasive there are great tools at this organization called the op-ed project and they're interested in hearing from especially underrepresented people so a lot of bylines for opinions is um, are not from women or from people of color. So they're especially interested in sort of supporting people to get their opinion pieces out, but the resources are great for anyone. And then, you know, there's also opportunities like for labs. I'm not sure if you have like some kind of blog already at MCLL, but there are, you know, there are opportunities to do some blogging there. Yeah, Pint of Science is wonderful. One of my friends is the national organizer. Sandra just put that in the chat. So that's a, a really fun place to share science too. And a big one too for people who are interested in doing this in a more formal way is to just make sure that your online profile or sort of whatever your sort of like calling card is on the internet that you include that you enjoy doing this kind of thing and you're more likely to get contacted to, to do it. So just a few things there. And then I had a few resources here for places that you might want to check out that are, you know, kind of active science communication sites or have resources for people who want to work in this direction. So I'm going to uh, just say, you know, thank you for listening. And um, I am on Twitter if anyone else is and wants to follow me. And I'm just going to stop sharing here and drop these slides in a PDF format into the chat so everyone can, can pick those up. And I'm also happy to have you any questions or anything that you'd like to, to chat about too. I don't have to rush off. 